Thank you, Brian and, and everybody. All right. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can listen to the Lord. Every human word is important in as much as it is leading to the word of God. And this is especially true when we are listening to preaching. Let's bring to our minds the presence of the Lord. His face, his voice, his kindness, his mercy. And let's unite our hearts with his heart as we say it together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Obedience and conversion. This talk, my friends, will have two parts. First, we will begin with etymology, which is surprisingly fruitful, far more than I personally expected. Etymology will lead us a long way. And secondly, we will um, address a particular point, which is the relation between obedience and friendship. Obedience and friendship. Those are the two parts of this talk. So let's go, uh, let's go to the first part which is the etymology. Okay. Here we are. The word obedience comes from the Latin, ob audire. Audire. Audire, all audio, what you listen to, what you hear. Ob audire can roughly be translated as because of what I listen to. So the very root of obedience is the capacity and disposition to listen, to receive a word different from my word, an opinion different from my opinion. The opposite to obedience is therefore the self-centered person that only pays attention to his or her own words, thoughts, and interests. The root of obedience is the capacity to receive a word different from my word. In that sense, 
Obedience is a sort of openness. And when we speak of the contrary to obedience, we are referring to something or someone that is closed, closed in itself, closed in himself, in herself. We are invited to open our heart to accept a word that is different from my own taste, my own opinion, my own thoughts. The first commandment of the law of the Lord begins with the simplest act of hearing. Thus, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4, and five, hear, O Israel, hear. That's the beginning of the law of the Lord. That's the beginning of the covenant. That's the beginning of the long road that Israel will take in order to get to the promised land and to receive every blessing, every, every blessing from God. All that starts with this simple commandment, hear, O Israel. It is like saying, open your heart, open your ears, open your life. Do accept something that is new from, for you, but is not new for God from God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. We can see that obedience is like the opening and through this opening through this door, so to speak, the stream of God's love will come to inhabit you, to dwell within you. But the first thing is that you open the door. And of course, we are called to open the door because the Lord will respect your decision. If you remain closed, every blessing will remain outside, out of your reach, out of your possibilities. Once the door is open, the powerful stream of God's will, of God's plan for you and for your family and for your region and for your country will become true. We must emphasize that this commandment is addressed to the entire people of God. It is not restricted to a particular group for example, the Levites or the priests. This is for everybody. And the reason we can say that this is for everybody is that everybody deserves to be loved and to share his or her part in God's plan, in God's blessing. If we put someone outside obedience, we are putting that person outside God's plan and God's loving care. To be obedient is to enter willingly, voluntarily to enter into God's plan which means, of course, 
to enter into the stream of your loving care, into the stream of his blessings. This is for everybody. Consecrated people, religious, for example, male and female, we have some particular vows. You know them very well. Poverty, chastity, obedience. But when we speak of obedience from a biblical standpoint, we have to say that this is connected with every human heart. Everyone is connected with God's heart because he created us so that we could receive his loving care and his blessing. One of the bitterest remarks God makes regarding his people is exactly that they do not listen. It is what we found in Psalm 95. This is the Psalm that in most cases opens up the entire prayer of the day. This is the invitation to God's praise that is at the beginning of the liturgy of the hours, as we all probably know. We take a few verses from this psalm, from verse 7 to verse 10. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah, as you did that day at Maza in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. Wow. This is a powerful message. What did happen at Meribah, at Massa? This was in the wilderness. That was probably the worst crisis in the long road of the people of God. They were invited, they were called to the promised land. But thirst was very, very strong. And people got tired of difficulties. Clearly, the wilderness is not the most friendly place to be in. And they were tired of difficulties. Everything was so difficult to eat to drink, to rest, everything was difficult. They were tired. And because of that fatigue, they were rebellious towards God. They were, they were not able, they couldn't believe another word from God. They had followed it, not in a perfect way, but they had followed it, the word of the God up to that point, but they were tired. And because of that tiredness, of that fatigue, they proved to be incapable of believing another word. So they closed their minds. That was the time when Moses had to strike the rock in order to get water for the people. 
They could not believe another word. That was too much for them. And I think the, 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 the situation they were living, they were going through, has some parallel with aspects and times and passages of our own lives. Because this is telling us that times of trial, times of fatigue, times of persecution, times of difficulty, these are the times when obedience is most needed, but again, these are the times when it is more difficult to obey. In the text of the Psalm, we should underline firstly, that it is not limited to a particular class or groups of people. Obedience is not limited. Listening to God, I love this expression. Listening to God is the right and duty of everyone is the right. It is the right of the people to receive the entire message from God. It is the right of the people to receive what they will love and what they will loathe. It is the right of the people. And I am emphasizing this point because you and I are preachers. I consider myself from my own service in the church as a missionary. And it is our duty to transmit, to share the word of God in its entirety, the complete word of God, what will be loved and what will be loathed. People will love us and people will hate us, but it is their right and it is also their duty to receive the word of God. This is for everyone who belongs to the people God chose and blessed. This is the first point regarding the verses from Psalm 95. Secondly, it is interesting to highlight the verb in verse 10. The former translation, this comes from the NIV, the New International Version. The translation says, I was angry. It is a bit diluted to say that God was angry. I checked another translations, other translations, and usually they are more graphic. I grieved. I grieved and disgusted. I despised. In Spanish, there is a most graphic expression for this. For those of you who know Spanish, the expression is aquella generación me asqueó. This is equivalent to I was disgusted with these people. I despise these people. The general meaning points to the utter rejection of those who have rejected the voice of the Lord. That's the meaning of that verb, that verse 10. Utter rejection is what can be expected for those who have rejected the voice of the Lord. Lastly, take into account the most serious consequence of this deafness. They shall never enter my rest. On this regard, we may remember what the letter to the Hebrews Chapter three, have to teach us. 
and I take the text from the letter to the Hebrews. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, daily. Encourage one another daily. Please do love your neighbor. Do love your companion in the mission, encouraging him. Encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. Those words, Meriba and Massa, are translated like rebellion, rebellion against God. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. My friends, we can see that there is a tight relationship between hearing, believing, and obeying. There is a very tight, very close connection between those three verbs, hearing, believing, and obeying. The obeying part is not possible without the hearing and believing. And then we also should underline the importance of this word, rest, rest. What, what is in it? Life is difficult. Toil and temptation, trial and persecution are very frequently around and against the life of the believer. Life is difficult, it's not easy, okay? But then we are promised, we have received the promise to get some rest and to get to enter into the fullness of God's rest. But what happened to those who were walking, journeying through the wilderness and did not believe in God? They never entered into the rest. They were not able to get real rest. There's no rest outside of obedience. There's no rest. And again, this is a powerful message that comes from the Bible. There's no rest. Life will be only trial and difficulty and battleship all the time, all the time without rest. There is a word from St. Catherine of Siena. 
this consecrated virgin from the 14th century. St. Catherine of Siena says that when the soul is in sin, it cannot get any rest. We have some word in English for that, restlessness. This is the person that is constantly incapable of finding some peace of mind. So when rejecting God, we're choosing the path of restlessness, the path of never finding real peace of mind. So this is serious. Not listening is equivalent to rejecting God. And so it leads directly to the path of sin, unbelief, and eventually to death itself. Yet, even the people, even if the people does not listen, it does not mean that they will go away without a message. Now we go to the prophet Ezekiel. I repeat myself, if the people does not listen, it does not mean that they will go away without a message. We read in Ezekiel chapter two, the people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is quite, quite remarkable. The voice of the Lord can be rejected, but the fact that he has spoken remains true and undeniable. In fact, what they do, once the word has been pronounced before them, determines their future and even their eternal destiny. So in, in, the, same, in the same line, we read in Matthew chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So even if the people is not paying attention, even if the people are not listening, there will be consequences. We must understand that the word of God is never given in vain. There will be consequences always. God cannot be rejected without consequences. In a different tone, we can learn that there is a way to improving our obedience just by improving our hearing. Well, this is the part of the good news. Many among us, many of us have been rebellious and sinners. We humbly admit that. But there is good news. There is a way to improving our obedience. And it is not only a matter of willing and willing and willing. It is not only the exercise of your will. You can improve your obedience just by improving your hearing. We read 
in chapter 8 of the gospel according to Luke. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. I love this passage because of this word, how. Consider carefully how you listen. If you improve the how, the way you listen, you improve the fruit from your listening. And if you improve the fruit of your listening, obedience will follow in an easier way. Consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have even what they think they have will be taken from them. This is the word from the Lord in the gospel according to Luke. And I come again to the central message. Improve your obedience, improving your listening. And the key part is consider carefully how you listen. Some verbs give us a hand in grasping what is implied in improving our listening. Some verbs, verbs like heaving, pondering, meditating, remembering, repeating. We go again. We come back to Deuteronomy, chapter 6. You remember that the essence of the commandment is very clear. Love God with all your heart. But please pay attention to the full text. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. All these actions, what are they telling us? All these actions, talk about them, Tie them as symbols, write them on the door, door frames of your houses. All these actions in a very, in a very graphic way, in a very visual way, if you like, are telling us the way of improving our listening, heeding, pondering, meditating, remembering, repeating. Before we continue with the second part of this talk, please allow me to emphasize the verb meditating. Because my friends, during my lifetime, there has been a change, a dramatic change for the worse in the meaning of the word meditate. For most people nowadays, I don't know, of course, the situation in every country, in every region, but I suspect it's more or less the same everywhere. Meditate and meditation nowadays is considered something like having a blank state of mind like the emptiness of your mind in the way of yoga and Buddhism. Most people, when hearing the word meditation, what come to their minds is to have an empty mind, to dwell in the void, 
That's what most people understand when they hear meditating. But there is a Christian understanding of that word. There is a Christian understanding of meditation. And meditation is not about emptying your head or your mind or your brain. It's the other way around. It's filling your mind and your heart and your brain, if you like, with the word of God. It is not about emptiness. It is about being full. It is the fullness of God's presence within us. It is God dwelling within us so that we can dwell in him. That's the central message of John chapter 15. So we have to say that true meditation is the key point to improving our obedience. And I repeat myself, it is not only a matter of willing and willing and willing. It is far more than that. It is about improving my listening. It is opening the door because it is very clear that we are not capable, we are not capable of obey the law of the Lord just using our own strength. We need the strength that comes from God in order to obey God. Now let's move on. Obedience and friendship. What's the reason for this title? And what's its relationship with conversion? It is quite common in our time to define Christian life as being friends with Jesus Christ. Christ, my friend, so beautiful and so true. It is not a bad idea. It has a strong biblical foundation, but we should remember that there is a risk in this kind of language. It, is, it depends heavily on whatever each one understand by being friends. So the expression in itself is perfect and it is beautiful. Christian life is being friends with Jesus Christ. Saint Teresa of Jesus, Saint Teresa of Avila used to say that being a saint is being a strong friend of Jesus. Strong friends of Jesus. Those are the saints. Beautiful. It is not a bad idea. Of course, it is not. But there is a risk in this kind of language. It depends heavily on whatever each one understands by being friends. Some people nowadays look at friendship as a way of having someone that approves of my life, of my choices, of my tastes, of my options, of my decisions. Someone that is backing me, giving me support, but I like a little more the other expression, backing me, backing me in the sense of approving and giving me strength and courage to continue the way I like, I prefer. That way, which is very common nowadays, that way of looking at friendship 
can be deceiving when we come to Christian life. Because Jesus is not in our lives just to back whatever we choose to do, whatever we decide to do, whatever we see fitting for each one of us. Christ is not simply an engine giving us power so that we can go wherever we prefer, whatever we like. That's not Christ. It's not just an, a powerful engine. He's also the steering wheel. He's also the light for the road. And he's also the road. And he's also the destiny of the road. So it is, it is a bit deceiving, I repeat. It is a bit deceiving that we leave the message just on saying, let's be friends with Jesus. If we understand correctly what friends, what being friends means, it's okay, it's perfect. But probably, probably we are not understanding exactly what means to be friends with Jesus. More importantly, we must focus in what the Bible and the faith of the church do understand by being one of Jesus' friends. And now we go to John chapter 15, as it was announced. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, this is the Lord who speaks. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy, wow, joy. I have told you this so that my joy, this is the Lord who speaks, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. You are my friends, friends, you are my friends if you do what I command. This is the relationship between friendship and obedience. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Please do note the point of bearing fruit, bearing fruit and bearing fruit. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. 
This is my command, love each other. Okay, some points to highlight. These were verses five to 17 of chapter 15 in the gospel according to John. We must begin by recognizing our dependence on Christ. And probably this is not politically correct, but our relationship with Christ is not one of equals. We usually think of friendship as a horizontal or symmetrical relationship. It is not so with Christ. May I remember that particular passage when Peter, the apostle, was ready and willing to give counsel to Jesus Christ. Peter was thinking of a very horizontal relationship, a symmetrical relationship with Jesus. Something in the line of you counsel, you give counsel to me, I give counsel to you. And Peter says to the Lord, after Christ was speaking of suffering the cross and going through his horrible passion, most painful and gruesome passion, Peter takes the Lord apart, you remember that, and Peter says to the Lord, God forbids, this will never happen to you. Peter is giving counsel to the Lord, and Peter is saying to the Lord, stop preaching about the cross. You are about to discourage people. This is not the language a leader should have, should use. Stop saying that. This is not good for you, Lord Jesus Christ. I am giving you freely of charge. I am giving you some counsel. Oh, this is so funny. And the Lord stops Peter on his tracks and then says to Peter, go behind me. Go behind me. The Greek text says, opiso mu, which is translated exactly for behind me, Peter. The leader in this business is me. So we are friends, but you are the disciple and I am the leader. Got it? <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't imagine the Lord saying something like that to Peter. Got it. We are friends, Peter. Okay. But you are not to give me counsel. You are not to teach me. Go to your place. And for the rest of the day, you are allowed to remain silent. And that's it. So, so that, that's the way. Being friends with Jesus is perfectly said. And it is, it is a very beautiful expression. But please keep your place. You're the disciple. And he's the leader. And he's the one in front and leading the way and opening the way and showing the way. He is the way. And we are disciples. So we begin by recognizing our dependence on Christ. This is not a relationship of equals. It takes time. I speak for myself. It takes time to allow this thought to sink in. To sink in. That at the same time, 
I love Jesus Christ. He loves me. I'm friends with Jesus Christ and his friends with me. But he's the leader. He's the teacher. He's the master. I am the follower. I am the disciple. I am the one who is learning. The one who obeys. It takes time to allow this thought to sink in. But it is crucial to digest what this dependence means. Remaining in Christ is a process that entails a progressive identification with his will, his plan, his way of doing things. Progressive identification with his will, his plan, his way of doing things. We learn to be like Jesus, remaining with Jesus, living with Jesus. Not by manner of imposition, like crushing our own plans or ignoring our deep desires. That's not the way of true obedience, crushing our own plans or ignoring our deep desires. But through discovering his wisdom, his goodness, in a word, realizing that the best of me resides within Jesus Christ. So we come to obedience, we reach obedience through realizing that the best of each one of us resides, dwells within Jesus Christ. So he is the one, he is the one that can really tell me what is best for me. Porque, because in fact, the best of me is not within me, it is within him. Again, we need time to allow this thought to sink in. The best of me resides in Jesus Christ. I have not, I do not possess the best part of myself. I do not possess that. It is within Jesus Christ. And I have to encounter it and receive it from him. To receive it from him. The fountain and reference for the love Christ has for us is God the Father himself. You remember that the Lord said, like my father has loved me, I have loved you. The fountain and reference for the love Christ for us is God the Father himself. We should be reminded that our love from Christ and our love for Christ has a heavenly model. And consequently, the quality of Christian friendship comes from heaven. The quality of Christian friendship comes from heaven. What does it mean? This is important because earthly criteria should not have too much power in defining what being friends is. Earthly criteria. And what are earthly criteria? Well, earthly criteria means what is profitable for me, what is useful for me, 
what I can take pleasure on. This is our earthly criteria. When we are just looking for our own interest, when we are just looking for what is pleasurable, what is tasteful and useful for us, these are earthly criteria. And it is important that the love that unites us with Christ is not marked and subject to earthly criteria. Otherwise, we will be Christians as long as it is profitable for us, as it goes along with our interests, as long as it is pleasurable. So in short terms, we will not be Christians at all. Earthly criteria should not have too much power. The Lord links friendship and obedience. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love, you are my friends if you do what I command. Well, this is not the usual way of thinking of friendship. Can you imagine some of your friends, any of your friends telling you, okay, we will be friends, but you will do what I command. This is not exactly what friends usually sounds like, but it is different. It is different when we speak of Jesus Christ. Why? Because his command springs from his love. His command, his command comes from the fountain of his goodness. His command is an expression of the good he wills for me. He is the one who truly and deeply and perfectly and utterly and endlessly loves me. So following his command, I'm just entering into his love. This is the reason, this is why we can say that obeying Jesus Christ is the way of being friends with him. We tend to connect love with a warm feeling, with choosing one another, with being happy with the loved ones. Jesus and the Bible in general see love more in connection with bringing real good to the loved ones. That Jesus loves me means that Jesus brings real good to my life because I am his loved one. He's bringing real good to my life. And now you can ask, and how on earth can I bring good to Jesus who is God and who possess everything and who has power over everything? How can I bring some good to Jesus? Do you remember that repeated expression, bearing fruit, bearing fruit, and a bearing fruit? That's the good that Jesus is expecting and willing from you. Bearing fruit. Do something that lasts. Do something that remains alive in the people you are with. 
be a blessing to that people in a way that is transforming their lives for the better. Do something that remains, that lasts, and is good. That's bearing fruit. And that's the good that we can do for Jesus Christ. Whatever you did for these, the little ones, you did for me. It is therefore logical that keeping Christ's commands is just a way of finding out and bringing out the best for the ones we love. And we finish with this thought. It is also worth noting that joy, joy, this is not only working and working and toiling and being in trial and being tested and being persecuted. No, nope. There is joy. Joy falls after obedience and friendship. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Joy, joy will be in you. We thank God. We thank God for his word. We thank God for his mercy. We thank God for his command. We thank God for the gift of gathering together as we are today, listening to God's word and entering more willingly in the path of obedience. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Amen.